everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to feel greater freedom and peace with the shape of your body, then do we have the Physical Disobedience Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Sarah Hayes Coomer, a certified personal trainer, wellness coach, diet abolitionist, and the author of Lightness of Body and Mind and her latest to set you free, Physical Disobedience. And that's just what I want to talk with her about today, about an unruly guide to health, stamina, busting through paradigms, taking control of our lives, and making great change in the world. That plus we'll talk about SpongeBob SquarePants, mice and microphones, gotcha, J-Lo and ponytails, Felix Ivanov and bouncing steel beams, Wiley Coyote and cortisone, what we can all learn from She-Ra, and what in the world a crime-fighting, BS-bashing, comfy, cozy-wearing ninja has to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Are you ready to shine? I am ready. Woohoo! <laughs> so before we dive right into things, what was your relationship with your body like in your earliest years? Um, you mean childhood or do you mean yes. early adulthood? We'll in go childhood, childhood before seventh grade. Ah, before seventh grade. Um, I was, I think I was the chubby kid, but not the fat kid. So I think I felt always a little bit awkward mm -hmm. and uncomfortable and was kind of the kid that was bullied in school and, and that sort of stuff and just never really found my footing and never found my body as, um, something that I wanted to take with me into the world. I wanted to leave it behind. And how did that begin to change? Thank you for sharing. How did that begin to change once you got to seventh grade? Um, well, when puberty hit, I think that um, it got worse. <laughs> and then the older I got into my late teens and early 20s, it got worse and worse and worse over the years. Um, there was probably a little time around seventh or eighth grade when it, it it felt okay for a minute. I was distracted by other things, but then as womanly hips started to develop and things like that, I just, I wanted to, as I wrote in my first book, literally slice them off with a kitchen knife. And I used to fantasize about this and it was deeply unhealthy. And then high school going into college, when did you start to have real troubles with eating? And I guess you were introduced to some not so good habits in college as well. Yep, I went to a conservatory and um, there were a lot of dancers around and they had some extremely unhealthy habits. Um, and eventually for me, that ballooned into bulimia and hiding food and um, hoarding food and all of that. Um, so that took me through college and then into my early 20s was the worst of that. And then I just made a decision that I was going to um, go out and pretty much let the mountains heal me. So this vi vision behind you is making me very happy. Very, very cool. How did the mountains start to heal you? And how in the world did you transition into a life of personal training? So I was living in New York City and I was in a deeply, deeply unhealthy place in my heart and in my body. Mm -hmm. And so I started going out into Central Park and I would go and literally just walk around the reservoir and lay on the grass and look up at the space between the leaves. And it was the only time that I had true peace. So I took a deep breath and I decided that New York City was probably not the best place for me if I needed that nature to heal me. So I moved to Los Angeles, which was definitely a step forward, but still in a very urban environment. Um, but at least there I had access to Griffith Park and I could go hiking up in those mountains. And I went almost every day for the seven years that I lived there and just put one foot in front of the other and eventually I realized that the days that I didn't want to go the most were the days that I needed to go the most. And so I would just, even if it was going to be only a 15 or 20 minute hike, I would do that. And most times it turned into an hour or more. How did you know to switch it around in your mind? It's something I work with, with clients on. It's something my wife, Jessica, in her healing journey, it's been so important at times for her to get out at the times 
she least has wanted to. How have you wrapped your mind around that? I think enough of a practice when you actually viscerally experience how that exposure to the outdoors seeps into this, your cellular body and the way that it lifts your heart and really the way that it opens your mind, it gives you ideas. It makes you think, oh, what if I moved from New York to, to somewhere with oceans and mountains and, you know, which wouldn't have occurred to me if I had just been in the apartment in that depressed place obsessing over food. So I had to get outdoors in order to have those epiphanies. And once you start to see how those feed your life, then I think it becomes a lot easier to do that. We lived for a few years just outside New York City on the uh, New Jersey, New York border. And there were some very special, it was surprising both who could get there and who couldn't, some very special um, uh, state parks and and forests just outside of New York City. Certain people could wrap their minds around, I can get off of the island and get out into nature. And yeah. other people, it, it wasn't even within their paradigm. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And it's accessible almost everywhere, even in New York. So how did you, so you spend seven years healing at what point did you flip the switch and say, this is my journey to help others get fit and to help others to heal? So I was in LA and I was doing my daily hiking, which turned essentially into a daily therapy or meditation. Um, and I decided that I, I realized that the reason I was doing that was not to manage my body or to control it or to try to manipulate it in some way, but that I was actually trying to access it and support it and make peace with it. And that to me seemed like a pretty radical notion, especially in Los Angeles. Um, so I was working a day job in an office at that time, and I started enrolling in courses at UCLA in physiology and nutrition and uh, Buddhist meditation and philosophy, and uh, realized that um, what I wanted to do was create uh, that space of making peace with your body for people like me who were really struggling which was a strange thing in Los Angeles. If you're going to be a personal trainer, you're usually going to be like, who's your celebrity client? And you know, what marathon are you training for? And I was trying to access people who were having a time, hard time just getting out the door to take care of themselves in any way. So I had a very different approach to it. Um, and that became a, a real mission for me. And the more that I reached out and the more I connected with my clients, the further along in my own journey I got. It's, it's fascinating. One of the things you talk about in the book is while we talk about, you know, this celebrity and that celebrity and their bodies, the people who we really look up to, the authors, people who are very grounded, very centered, may not necessarily be the L.A. perfect body, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. So what is physical disobedience? So physical disobedience is about defying the expectations and the norms that are placed on us both by society and also ultimately by ourselves. So we have these expectations of how our bodies are supposed to look or how they're supposed to perform um, or even the ways that we're supposed to treat them. You're supposed to do this particular kind of exercise. You know, if you're not a runner, then you fail. And for some people, that's not the thing. So when we defy all of those expectations, then we can actually tune in and listen and hear what our bodies are trying to tell us. And when we do that, we have all the information we need to be in the healthiest, strongest possible state we can be. It means, and to me, a big part of it means not just letting go of the social norms, but uh, I guess I'll use a powerful term here. Maybe hypnotic is the one I want to go with. Well, I was going to say brainwash, but we have this image that's portrayed on us by society. I, I pulled up the Dove study before, yeah. before this, uh, this show. Only 4% of women around the world consider themselves beautiful. Only 11% of girls globally consider themselves beautiful. And yet, 
almost 72% feel pressure to be beautiful. And I'm guessing that a number is actually even higher than that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that pressure and that what happens as a result of that is so damaging. It's such a disconnect because what I have seen, and there's, that's what the whole first chapter of the book is called strange beauty. And it's about redefining what beauty looks like and what beauty means. And what I see after working with people, I work with a lot of special populations, people who are struggling with disability, cancer, depression, eating disorders, menopause, pregnancy, all kinds of things where people are really struggling the beauty that I see in these people and the breakthroughs that they make are so extraordinary. And when you start to see that in the people you care about, it's a lot easier to turn that around and hold up a mirror and see that beauty in yourself as well. And it sounds to me like that beauty, we have to let go of the idea. And we just had a guest on about this, Petra Kolber. We were talking about perfectionism. You have to let go with that pursuit of perfectionism to see the true beauty inside of yourself. Yeah. And, and perfection, what does that even mean? You know, things that are, that are technically perfect are really kind of boring. They're not very interesting. If you look at wood grain or something like that, you see so much more beauty when there's imperfections in it. And same with our bodies. I, I love that. And I love how, the, how you put that. So jumping forward in the book, what do you mean the potential, you say the potential we squander by picking our bodies to pieces is catastrophic? So I tell a story in the book about going over to Europe when I was in college in the summertime and helping um, some refugees and helping some orphans in Poland and uh, how obsessed I was that entire time with my body, with the food I was eating, with the way that I looked. I was teaching these little kids who had been through incredible suffering dance classes and Tai Chi classes and things like that. And they were just having the time of their lives for the first time in a long time. And I was obsessed with how my knees looked and it was absurd. And it was, it, I squandered my, so much of what I could have experienced and learned there because I wasn't focused because I was focused on all the wrong things and I wasn't focused on the kids and the breakthroughs that we were having. So that goes then into business meetings and first dates and relationships and things when we spend all of our time turned inward mm -hmm. and tearing our bodies to shreds, we lose enormous opportunities everywhere we turn. So how is it you say learning to appreciate the function and dignities of our body is a discipline? Is that because we have to peel away the layers of what we've been taught? It's a practice. It's, it's truly a practice of both peeling away the mental and psychological understanding, like you say, and also the ways that we move in the world because we're very busy kind of shutting down or trying to shield or cover up in some way um, instead of just showing up and being present and being in a room. And it's really disconcerting for a lot of people when women in particular do that, when they stop apologizing with their posture. So it's, yeah, it's really interesting what happens when you step away from that and just show up. Since you use the term shielding, I've got to go there. It's just too perfect of a segue. What can we learn from She-Ra? She-Ra! She-Ra is the best. So she was a superhero in the 1980s. And I'm giving up my age here. But um, so She-Ra has a, sh a shield of protection mm -hmm. um, that she uses. And she's not really an aggressive superhero. She tends to um, be, she, she deflects and then she uses alternative methods to, to accomplish her means, um, mostly mental powers. Um, but this shield of protection that I talk about in the book is about finding a a cause, whatever your thing might be that you really truly care about that is above and beyond yourself and beginning to view that as your shield of protection so that the work that you're doing in the world to make it better also is has the effect of shielding you from some of the suffering you might be experiencing watching other people's pain in the world. So it feeds you and gives you peace knowing that you're making a contribution. Also gives you purpose. Yeah. Absolutely. What does it mean to really access our bodies? It was something you said, access our bodies and make peace with our bodies. What does that mean to you? 
To me, that means grounding, first of all, feeling our connection with the earth, and then also um, finding the strength, say, when you sit up Mm -hmm. and you're going to get out of bed in the morning, what does that feel like to have the abdominal strength to sit up in bed and then the leg strength to stand up and be upright? And to find and appreciate that. So that's minutia right there. But that's the very beginning of the day. And then you can find that anywhere and everywhere that you are throughout your day. You say that, but it actually brings me back in time because I'm sitting here. I'm, I'm a fully functional athletic being, but I have twin titanium fever, femurs and spikes going through my hips. I and when you that. put it that way, standing out of bed is actually, you know, a beautiful miracle for myself, but Absolutely. for all of us as well. All of us, all of us, every single one of us. Yep. So on that note, what's it mean to give our mice a microphone? <laughs> so we have, I have a, a an analogy in the book about having a football field full of mice and the mice are running around in the middle of this football game and they're trying to be heard. And so the football game is the chaos and the normal activity of our lives. And these little mice are these little messages from our bodies. It's going, ah, I got some neck pain or Ooh, plantar fasciitis or whatever it is that's going on with people. Um, and we don't listen to those mice and they are talking to us constantly. There is always something going on that doesn't feel quite right in our bodies. And if we take time to stop, hear those messages and begin to address them, then we can release ourselves from that pain and have so much more potential to live freely without that suffering. One of the key words that you just mentioned that is so hard for people is stop. Because we're told in our modern society, I mean, we're shown on pharmaceutical ad after pharmaceutical ad, the body wears down. It's going to break down. You've got to go through life. Once you get soreness, that's it. In fact, if you go to a doctor past a certain age and you say, for instance, yourself, I have a sore sore, sore, sore shoulder, the doctor's going to go, what do you expect at your age? Yep. Yep. Completely. And it just doesn't have to be that way. I mean, our bodies are talking to us, so there's always going to be some message coming, but we can, we can move through them, but we have to stop and you have to kind of lean back into them and start to see where is that pain coming from? How can I breathe differently? Is there a muscle I can strengthen? Can I stretch somehow? There are so many different ways to address it. How do you teach your clients that they can be proactive about these things rather than just succumb to them? Well, if you think about succumbing, if you really go down that road and think about what succumbing looks like in six months or six years, you realize that you're really going down a rabbit hole and that situation is only going to get worse. So the best thing to do is to try to breathe into and through some of that pain and try to find, kind of dance around and find some alternative therapies that might work um, that could help with that and sometimes traditional medicine as well. Um, but to try to try different things, new things, this is another form of disobedience to say, well, that kind of sounded freaky to me before, but maybe I'll try Reiki, you know, something like that, that might help you break through if you just open, open your mind and your bar- body, body and your heart to it. When, when I was uh, 12, something like 12 years of, of age, I had had six knee operations at that point, no left ACL, still don't have it. And they had shown me on x-ray, thrown it up on the, on the white box, to show me where I had an arthritic knee and told me I'd be lucky walking by the time I was 18. And that is where my physical disobedience started. Because I'm yes. like, oh, heck no, not a chance. You know more about your bo- my body than I do. Yep, absolutely. So let's go from there. Let's talk about movement. Let's talk about exercise. Let's talk about one of the key myth sets out there in the world. Exercise is what's going to make you lose weight. Yes, that is not true. (laughs) And a lot of people feel that way. And then they they work out and they work out and they don't lose weight and they get frustrated. I've seen so many people sign up for boot camp or for, you know, to train for a 10K or something. And a lot of them actually end up gaining weight because it triggers their hunger, which is normal and fine. Um, but, uh, as I say in the book, if anybody tells you that you're going to lose weight solely through exercise, then you need to 
seriously check their credentials because there is a, you have to look at your diet. You have to look at how much you move throughout the day when you're not exercising. Moving our bodies is a full-time thing when we are awake. So um, it's something to stay active all the time. Let's talk about that, what moving and activity mean. I had a, a guest on several years ago, uh, a researcher who was talking about that exercise is not what we think it is. That movement, walking to and from the car, going upstairs, lifestyle changes. Just like you say, it doesn't have to be slaving away in the gym. Yeah, yeah, and people really, it's really, really hard for people to believe that those little modifications make a difference, but they are life altering. If you really start to become what I call becoming an exercise opportunist, so you're looking for any, any, any way to move. I stretch all day. I stretch all day long. I do it on the phone. I do it while I'm making dinner. I do it when I'm working all the time. Um, because it just keeps my body limber and moving and ready to, to go. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I think an exercise also is, is it stimulates every body system that we have. So it's good for us. I don't mean to say that it is not good for us. It is good for us in every way you can imagine for sleep, for your skin tone, for your sex life, for whatever you can think of. And so, um, it's, those are the reasons to exercise, not to try to lose weight. So how do we become an exercised, exercise opportunist? I love it. So you look for those opportunities that you were just talking about. You park as far as you possibly can from mm -hmm. the door of the mall, or you climb the stairs as many times as you can in your office building, or you stretch every single night before bed or with your coffee. You tie it to your daily rituals that you're doing already so that you're, again, accessing your body. You're making contact with it and creating an opportunity to hear those mice when they're talking to you. Awesome. One of the things I heard recently is the importance of actually saying thank you to our bodies. Yes. It's so important. Yeah. You know, even even thinking about going on book tour or something like that and and knowing that I don't present as a traditional personal trainer. I'm not like super buff and all the things that people expect when you walk into a room as a personal trainer who's an expert who's written a book. And so I have to even now take time, sit back, Take a minute with my body and say, this is the body that has taken me to this moment in my life. And I am so incredibly grateful for it. And I want to bring it with me. You have a really fun exercise in here, which is making a list of what works for you, paying homage to one or more of those body parts every day. Yeah. So you can pick one, you know. I can breathe air through my nose. I love my nose. And just spend some time with your nose for a day and really think about that. And Because people who have not experienced trauma, sometimes the people who have, have experienced trauma, like yourself, are the ones who are most appreciative and most grateful and most realized when it comes to, to taking care of and recognizing the value in their bodies. But for some people who haven't reached a, a more difficult time with their bodies, it's it's hard to remember that, like, Back pain makes it really hard to bend down and pick up a pen off the floor. Things like that where we just don't think about healthy people, don't tend to think about and appreciate how much value they have built into their bodies. From there, let's, let's keep on this body segment. This is really fascinating to me for a minute here. Let's talk about physical challenges to building confidence and self-care. For this, this year, for some reason, I got myself back into bicycle racing after 15 years off with my titanium parts. I thought I would never do it again. I still don't know where I'm going with it. And it's actually at times, as I discussed on a recent show, scaring the heck out of me. But having a carrot in front of you, any carrot, how helpful is it? It's so helpful. And it's most important that it's something that you love. If it's something that turns you on and excites you, it will work and it will bring your body to life. If it's something that you hate, it's going to make you miserable and you're going to quit or you're going to hurt yourself. So yeah, having that, having that passion for it and having that goal of, oh, I didn't get to do this for 15 years and I just want to do it. I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. It's not that, you know, you're going to do a triathlon or whatever, and maybe you will, probably you will. <laughs> I would, if but, I had closer access to a pool, I love to swim. I love to run, but around here with the daily show, I haven't had the access to a pool, but yeah. 
if that comes, why not? If, if I feel a passion, a calling, if it will be fun, enriching. We all do this backwards. We do it because we feel we have to do it, not Absolutely. because we want to do it. Yep. Yep. Yes. So you mentioned in the book, since you mentioned triathlons, what is it? What is the benefit of being perfectly, perfectly unjiggly, perfectly jiggly? What is the benefit of being perfectly jiggly? <laughs> yeah. So there's a triathlete that I interview in the book who talks about her jiggly parts and talks about how she's, you know, has thoughts so often about what people are thinking when she's running across the finish line as a champion triathlete. And it's just incredibly sobering to realize that everybody feels this way and everybody is jiggly because we are human. We are human with human bodies and these bodies are not made of iron and steel. And so no matter how far you get in your, in your quest to get in shape, it's never, you're, you're always going to be perfectly jiggly, at least a little bit. You know what's kind of funny when you think about it? If we went back in history, and in many cultures still today, the most in shape person isn't the one that's not carrying any body fat because when the trouble comes, they're going to make it about a day or two and conk out. It's yep. the one who actually has reserve. That's wealth. That's abundance. Quite literally, if they have a little extra, they're going to have greater endurance. Yeah. Even even imagery, if you look back to, you know, old paintings from, you know, two and three centuries ago, the the imagery was of the fat king, you know, and the belly and all of that stuff. And that's not what we're going for, but it is. It used to be a symbol of, of wealth and riches. We have hundreds of hummingbirds outside here. We have 14 different hummingbirds feeders with 10 ports each. And because of recent forest fires, all the hummingbirds in the area that lost their their, their land have found us. And now they have to literally double in weight, go from little two gram birds to four and a half gram birds to next month fly 2,500 miles as the smallest bird on earth, 2,500 miles from here to Peru. And if they were concerned about body image, not a single one would make it. <laughs> I love that story. That's so great. I love it. So, True. how can we heal our relationship then, not just with our body image? but with food. So food, yeah, food is is the stuff of life. It is it is a source of celebration and you know, for me as an ex bulimic, it so was not that. So it 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 ultimately can be a healing source, but it's really making that shift is tough, but I think the most important thing rather than thinking about taking something away, like I'm going to take away my pizza habit or my chocolate habit or whatever it is that people have. It's so much easier to think about building something in. So I talk about it like trying to uh, fill in the gaps of parched earth with flood water. Like it's coming up from underneath you and lifting you up. So these, so thinking about, did I get nutrition today? Did I get my, did I get a piece of fruit today? Did I get five pieces of fruit today, wherever you are on that journey? Did I have, you know, half of my dinner plate full of vegetables? It's about adding things in and you begin to start crowding out the bad and then your cravings change and it all comes from there. Adding to me is a positive. It's expansive. It's growth. It feels better. You're in, a, in alignment with the universe. Withholding, taking away, putting... Uh, it it feels to me like like punishment or my little inner child as soon as you say you no longer can have that my little inner child is going no <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally yeah but i want it i want more yeah and that's what happens when we when we start to deprive ourselves of things we become obsessed with them it's not working <laughs> an example of that is Tell me about your relationship with sugar and how you've done a, a best real world case scenario with it. Yeah. So sugar is often portrayed as the devil. People uh, do their, they, they're always going off of sugar. Everyone is always going off of sugar. And it's just to me, no way to live. Like I just love chocolate. And so I have built a daily, yeah, speaking of practice, a daily practice of a really small amount of dark chocolate, which actually has been shown to be really healthy for us. Also, fruit is literally 
the embodiment of abundance. It is, it is the fruit of the earth and it feeds us. So you look like you're going to say something. Well, yeah, I, I did for years. I, I had blood sugar challenges for years. I was pre-diabetic for many years. If there's a medical reason, that's a, that's a different question. But, but I, I took myself, I was living on Hawaii, took myself off everything on the glycemic index above 50 healed. I think more about the nutrition I put in and for a while fats I put in. And then I was able to, when Jessica got sick, we had on Anthony William, medical medium on the show, and he was putting her on a diet that had no fat to heal from mold toxicity. I said, I'm going to go along and try this. And for the first time in years, I was able to have food again and my blood sugar levels were stable and I cried. And I cried because fruit to me was allowing the sweetness of life back yeah. into my life. Yeah, and the whole point is that any one diet might not be the one for somebody, but if we're listening and if we're paying attention and if we're being disobedient to the rules we've followed in the past and the things that we tried in the past, then we can find and experiment and play and try to see what makes us feel most alive and most energetic. That's an important consideration. How do we tell what makes us most alive? For instance, sugar, fine in small amounts potentially, makes us feel like kids again potentially. And I know some people may be aghast, but, but I'm taking like you a balanced approach to life. But with that said, if we have too much of this, our energy levels plow through the floor and then we get more sugar and then more caffeine and then they plow through the floor, more sugar, more caffeine. How do we become aware or feel into our bodies? Yeah, so that energy crash is actually one of the greatest contributors to the obesity epidemic that we have. So we have this, um, I feel like crap, so I'm going to eat some sugar to get some energy to do what I need, and then you crash, and then you feel like crap again, and then it contributes to that cycle. Um, so that that is absolutely the case. So when... Again, if we're filling in the gaps mm -hmm. <laughs> with fiber and protein and fat and all of the things that are going to give us the, all of the nutrients from vegetables and, and nuts, nuts are really a great one that people often will cut out because of the fats, um, but they're healthy fats, so please eat your nuts. <laughs> um, so if we're filling in those gaps, then we're not as hungry and we start to put a floor underneath our energy. And once you can do that, you, you get you start to get a greater awareness of when you're feeling that sugar crash. And then you start to realize that maybe the box of donuts actually didn't. I thought it might it made me feel good in some way, but it actually made me feel a lot worse. But then you have to do that cycle for a while so that you have an authentic feeling about it, so that you have an authentic association. So it's not just a roll. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to quit the donuts, you know, instead of finding the real feeling in your body and stopping again and sinking into that awareness and then starting to make decisions based on how you're actually going to feel in the moment. I love that you brought up donuts because that's my weakness. I do <laughs> well with it, but I know that if I have a donut, well, one donut's okay. If I have more than one donut and I probably usually like have, it sounds crazy, half a donut at a time. If I have more, I can feel the energetic difference. All of a sudden, <laughs> Because you're in touch, but it, it takes a long time to get there. But you really can, because you can feel it on a much bigger level when you're eating half a dozen donuts. It just You just have to pay attention to it. And then, okay, maybe, and then you start to eat them either less frequently or three of them instead. And then you start to go, ah, it still doesn't feel that great. And you can make those better decisions as you go. Yeah, and like you said, in touch, because to me, the rule is sugar begets sugar. You have a little, you tend to want more, you tend to yeah. want more, you tend to want more. You mentioned another brilliant, a, a brilliant concept, floor underneath us. And I wonder if we can take it to the breath, because to me, this is in a sense, the ultimate floor. Yep, yep. You know, Meditation is a constantly evolving process, and it's one that I feel like is, is I'm having a moment with it recently. I'm, I'm breaking through on it a little bit, and it's really awesome. Tell me because, more. Tell me more. Yeah. So the... So my my mind is in my mind is the easiest place to be right now. And that is kind of remarkable because for most of my life that was not the case. So um it's it's still taking me by surprise. Every time I sit in meditation now, just even over the last month or so, 
I'm really feeling like, oh, this is a happy place. I just want to stay right here and keep breathing and keep sitting with it. And it's 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 a little disconcerting, um, but it's it's a really joyful thing. And the breath is absolutely key to finding that. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge you, and I'm gonna say, you go, girl. You dive in with <laughs> everything that you've got. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. So let's let's go from the breath to J Lo and ponytails. Yeah. So yeah, so in this fitness and wellness book, I have a chapter on fashion, which was really strange and difficult for me to write because I live in yoga pants and just cotton dresses. So um, I don't have any fashion awareness or skills of any kind, and I state that up front. Um, but uh, so so yeah, the chapter starts with J Lo, and she she is, or she sends me through In Style magazine a, a thing on how to do my ponytail, which. I don't know. That's the ponytail I've got going right now. But um, uh, so um, point being, there are lots of these voices, just like we were talking about with exercise and nutrition and everything else coming at us about the ways that we dress our bodies and the ways that we carry them into the world. So this chapter for me was an exploration of figuring out how to find out how to be me mm -hmm. in my body and in my fashion. And that is is still a new dance for me to try to figure out how, what feels right to me. So it's not about who I'm meeting up with and what they might be wearing or what circumstance I'm walking into. And of course, people have to make you know you have to you have to cover up and you have to make sure that you're appropriate for work and whatever. But um, but it's interesting how fun it is to to try to say to look at your closet in the morning and say well, what does this feel like to be me today what feels do I feel like you know blunt stones and jeans or do I feel like three inch wedges and you know a mini skirt I don't know yeah, you talk about in the book uh, like clogs and an attorney Right. <laughs> right. Like what happens if an attorney wears clogs to work? Does she get dismissed by her bosses or does she feel super powerful and, you know, take over the firm? And I think that depends on how she feels about her, her shoes and how she feels about those clogs. Well, you just brought up an important point, which is that our costumes, what we wear are our costumes. They're, they are what gives us our superpowers, what we feel comfortable in and what associations we make with our own individual clothing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And once you can start to, it's really interesting how you feel different when you, when you go into a space and you start to, it's disobedient. I'm walking into this space and I know everybody, like I'm down here in the South and sometimes you go into conservative, you know, rooms and you end up with a lot of people in suits and, you know, big floral hats and things like that. And if you walk in there in a black tank top and your hippie necklace, you know, then you might get some funny looks. But what does that feel like to feel good in that and to know that this is how I feel and this is who I am and I'm going to walk into this room and I'm going to own that. It's a really fun game to play. It's interesting. I had never thought about it in this terms, but many years ago, I guess I was big into, uh, what would we call it? Social, not civil disobedience. I guess fashion disobedience. Jessica and I, we wrote Barefoot Running and we wrote Barefoot Walking, Getting in Touch with the Earth. And for years, because of the health benefits, whenever weather allowed, we would be barefoot almost everywhere. Or more, I would be barefoot almost everywhere. And it certainly... It both took you out of the box, put you in your own other box, and forced you to look at the world a very, very different way. Yeah, and then, you know, people are going to react however they're going to react to Oh, that. my God, That's did they not react. really your problem. <laughs> I remember, I remember being on Maui. So at this point, you think you can be, you can go barefoot. Maui. I, I remember being on Maui, going into a Whole Foods uh, barefoot. Oh, I, mean, I had some real funny incidents. A pilot on a plane after I had gotten one plane, they had, the security had chastised me for being barefoot. Oh, was it JetBlue? The next plane I get on with my shoes on and the uh, co-pilot recognizes me and says, what are you doing in shoes? So that's one situation. Then I go to Whole Foods in Maui. I don't have my shoes on. We'd been playing on the beach all day. And they said, sorry, sir, you have to wear shoes in, in here. The next time I come in, Apollo, this giant he-man of a guy, uh, is the guard. And he sees me and recognizes me. And he goes, oh, sorry, sir. Uh, we checked with management. Take off those slippers. <laughs> wow. Well, see, changing the world right there. Changing the world. <laughs> All right, talking about changing the world, tell us about motherhood and childbirth. 
Yeah, so um, I'm a mom. I have a six-year-old. Um, if this was not something that I necessarily planned on or wanted to do in my life, it was um, pretty much the most terrifying thing I could have thought of was the idea of becoming pregnant, giving birth, and then mothering after that. Um, so I, I write very frankly about that in this book, which is a little bit scary, and I'm sure I'm going to get a fair amount of backlash about that. Um, but, but you're being honest, and, and there's, yeah. there's a strength and vulnerability, and we need more of that in the world today. Yeah, I think it's really powerful to be honest about motherhood because it's, it's um, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of people writing, doing some amazing writing out there about that. But it's, there are a lot of expectations around what a mother's supposed to look like and do and how they're supposed to behave and speak about motherhood. So, um, but I have found it. So, so one of the things I was afraid of was that, um, well, first I was afraid it was going to steal my body from me. Um, and then I was also afraid that it was going to steal my time and my passion and my purpose. And I found it to do the absolute opposite, um, which is that it 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 fed my fire to um, a be like what is uh, in those first few months I was just sort of sitting with what does a mom look like what does mom look like to me and. I realized that was really wrapped up in my mother and my grandmothers and all of that, and that I had the opportunity to define that for myself. And that was such power to be able to figure out my own path for that. Um, and then as far as my voice, I've written two books since then. It has driven me to use my downtime much more effectively because he needs me and he wants his mama and he wants me to be with him as much as possible. The time with him feeds that. And then my time when I'm away, I'm really leaning into what, what is, what is, what do I want him to see that a woman can be and what kind of voice do I want to be in the world? And it just, it really fed me in a really surprising way that I did not expect. <laughs> what is the importance on top of all the doingness? And this is something I know that you've had to work with your clients on with stopping that desire to go, 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 do, 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 do. Yeah. So, you know, when you, when you work a muscle, when you exercise a muscle, you are literally ripping the muscle fibers, which is what causes the soreness. And then those muscle fibers grow back together again. And that bond is stronger than ever. And the muscle grows and gets bigger and stronger. So I like to think of rest that way as well. You have to rest in order for those muscle fibers to heal and grow stronger. And that is true for every aspect of our lives. So we go, we go, we go, whether it's, you know, as a mom or whether it's in exercise or whether you're an activist or whatever it is, um, if you go, go, go until you are completely fatigued, you will ultimately collapse and you will lose your power. Whereas if you purposefully, again, creating a practice, uh, lean back into rest and find ways to, whether that rest is just being with friends with no purpose at all, or whether that's um, actual sleep or taking 15 minutes to just lay down on the couch and turn into a turtle and just <sighs> hide for a minute or whatever. <laughs> Whatever, whatever it is um, that you need to do um, to 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 create that space, it's only going to make you stronger. And once you realize how that feeds you, it's it's not hard to take it. The, the, <laughs> the, the reason you're laughing for people who aren't seeing the video is oh. uh, for my coaching. I always keep a little stuffed turtle on my desk, which is to represent going slowly, pausing, taking that rest and being more turtle-like through the journey, because that's sustainable. Yep, yep. And speaking yeah. of turtles, let's do turtles and Tai Chi. Felix Ivanov, metal beams in the importance of being not so hard. Right. So Felix was a movement professor that I had in college who taught Tai Chi and Taekwondo. And he was a Russian um, clown, essentially. He came from the clowning school of oh, acting in Russia. And he was just a 
fascinating and kind and gentle man, but he had these, you know, he would practice Tai Chi and Taekwondo every day. He had nunchucks. It was the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> and he didn't speak very good English, but so we're standing in class one day and he, uh, he's talking to us about our next exercise that we're going to do. And this huge steel beam comes falling down from the ceiling and it was a huge gym. So it's probably 30 feet in the air and it comes falling down and it hits him square on the head and he just gave his whole body, just his knees just reacted and the beam sort of bounced off and he shook his head and just kind of went glumps and and just went on with his explanation of what we were going to do and i was just standing there agog and um realized that it, it was the it was the most beautiful example of what he had been telling us always which is never lock your knees so he always was kind of in this flow with the universe around him and the world around him and was able to move with that in a way that kept him from getting hurt. And I find that to be a really wonderful example of how we can all move through our lives. So if we can be pliable, flexible, if we can move and flow with whatever challenges or pain or suffering come into our lives or even the joys, because they will pass, um, it, then we were able to bend and move with that and we're, we're able to get hurt and suffer a lot less. Beautiful. And there's, there's one last person I should ask you about talking about going with flow. Lo Lois Lee Frouchinger. Yes. Yes. She is an old woman. She is a 90, she actually has passed since I wrote that, but she was 96 years old when I interviewed her for the book. Um, and she had this incredible life where she, um, had to travel the world to, uh, including to places like Lebanon and Syria back in the 1960s with her husband for his work. Um, and he worked for the State Department. And she raised these women, these incredibly powerful women, and now down to her great grandchildren um, who are coming up, who, um, who, who are able to appreciate their bodies and to learn to go with the flow. So I asked her for her greatest nugget of wisdom. I hoped she would take me to the fountain of youth. Tell me, tell me, how did you live this amazing life? And how did you not get caught? She also had cancer twice. She's just been through an enormous amount. Um, and she went over and she pulled a mug out of her kitchen cabinet. And it said, keep calm and carry on. And I just thought... <laughs> Oh no, but it was so true. It was in, it's really the message that I got. There are several elderly women that I interview at the end of the book. Um, and it was really the, the consistent message that I got from most of these women, which was just keep calm and carry on. Um, and uh, it, it was, it, it's, it's really the final message of the book is that getting caught up in all the drama doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve anyone else. It doesn't allow you to contribute to the world in the way that you want to. And the best thing that we can do is lose the drama if possible. Woohoo! Yay! What one homework assignment? If I was to take off my hat, Sarah, and a coaching hat mm. and put it on you, what one homework assignment would you give people today so that they can dive into their bodies and become agents of change? I would say practice being present in your body. And that can mean by yourself in a room. Are you comfortable naked in a room by yourself? Practice that if that's where it starts. Or practice being present in a business meeting or in a in a ha having a coffee with your friend so that the the thoughts about the waistband cutting into your abdomen or your thighs spreading out on the chair or the you know all of the ways that we get pulled away from being present so finding a way to to be in your body in your day throughout your day and looking for those opportunities at every chance that you get Beautiful. And on those opportunities, Jessica always wants me to ask a question for parents and their kids. What can we do to help parents with their kids today in this? I just started a meditation practice with my son and started sending him to yoga class and he's six. And he actually so cool. yesterday said, he said, Mama, 
I said, and we did a five minute meditation and I said, and the little, the bell chimed at the end and he said, mama, can we do 10 more minutes? And I was like, yes, yes, we can. So I think, um, building those tools of awareness and being able to when when all the anxiety and all the you know I didn't do it right you know that kids do um to to say instead of trying to attack that problem to stop and to say can you stop can you breathe can you feel your belly can you take a deep breath for me and then taking them into that awareness and then also letting them know that nobody feels perfect and setting the example for them that, that we all feel a little crazy sometimes. And this is how we do it. When we feel crazy, this is what we do. I think we all need to hear what you just had to say. (laughs) On that note, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? I think when I see my clients and my friends and even in my own self, in my own life, when I see, when I'm able to see the extraordinary beauty in human bodies Mm -hmm. of all kinds, um, whether they're, you know, bodybuilders or, or, or in a wheelchair, um, just the extraordinary, extraordinary power of these living, breathing meat suits, as you say that we have at our disposal to allow us to live these lives. When I, when I see that transformation happening and somebody stops beating their body up and starts to see that beauty, it's really extraordinary. I love myself. I love myself. I'm putting my hand on my chest. This is not, yes. this is not narcissism. This is something we should all do, which is to yes. send ourselves as yes. much love as we possibly can because that's what's carrying us through this journey. Absolutely. So where can people go to find your beautiful book, Physical Disobedience, and to find out more? So my website is sarahayescoomer.com, and it's also on everywhere, online, in bookstores, and everywhere else. So, And can you give us that URL one more time? It's Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, Hayes, H-A-Y-S, Coomer, C-O-O-M-E-R.com. Fantastic. And if you didn't catch sarahayescoomer.com, come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll get you over to sarahayescoomer.com. So before we dive into a brief meditation, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today, Sarah? Appreciation for our bodies is the wildest form of disobedience. That's crazy and I love it. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Do you have a, uh, a brief meditation you wouldn't mind sharing with us? I do, yeah. So let's take that minute and let's find a time to stop. So if you want to sit in a chair or stand with your feet spread out on the floor, take a minute. If you want to put one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly you can do that or if you want to just stand neutral we're going to just close our eyes for a minute release the belly and i want to read you a little quote from a Leonard Cohen poem. When you call me close to tell me your body is not beautiful, I want to summon the eyes and hidden mouths of stone and light and water to testify against you. Your body is living and breathing, and moving, and present. And that is extraordinary. So anytime that you feel that your body is your enemy, 
take a moment just like this to sit with it. To appreciate something about it. Anything at all. And to let it be present and worthy and accounted for. Breathing in and breathing. Thank you for being here today. It's going to completely clash with the energy of what we've just done. <laughs> but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If we can start to make peace, I'm going to cry here. If we can start to make peace with our bodies. Just think of how much more peace we can bring to the world. Absolutely. There, there go the tears. <laughs> thank you so, so much, Sarah. This has been beautiful. I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. So got to crank it back up for the finish here. <laughs> so for everyone out there, this is Michael. <laughs> this is Michael Sandler, completely lost here, saying, be well, have fun, get physical disobedience, and discover greater freedom and greater peace today. And shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I lost it here at the end, Sarah, because this is so important and I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. It really meant the world to be on here today. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also leave your comments, have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're gonna get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>